Funding for this program is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. This program brought to you in part by Selco. Good evening and welcome to our first Reading for Life lecture. Reading for Life is a movement of imagination for the purpose of growing community around a shared love of literature. The idea is that real community begins and ends with our imaginations and a few resources, if any, as a vital to the imagination's development as works of literature. And I just wanna give a little introduction to our presenter tonight, Michael Verde. Michael graduated with the honors from the University of Texas Plan II Honors Program and earned an MA in Literary Studies from the University of Iowa. He holds an MA in the Theology from the University of Durham, England, where he graduated at the top of his international class. He taught for 15 years at the university, college prep school levels, mostly at Indiana University, and is currently completing his PhD with a focus on literary and religion studies. Michael founded Reading for Life in 2005. Tonight, our topic will be To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee. It's very appropriate that we should start this adventure with To Kill a Mockingbird, because arguably, and in this case, plausibly arguably, this is the most popular novel ever written in English. Uh, to date, something like 55 million copies of this novel has been sold. It's been translated in over 40 uh, languages. It is a common staple in high school curriculum. 1991, Library of Congress, in a survey, the, the prompt of which, which books have made the greatest difference in your life? The number one choice, uh, actually the number two choice, was To Kill a Mockingbird. The, the number one choice was the Bible. In 1999, the librarians of the United States, through the Library Journal, uh, determined that this, or decided rather, that this was the greatest novel of the century. And as recently as 2006, librarians in England, uh, when asked uh, what is the one book a person should read before he or she dies, To Kill a Mockingbird, actually this time finished first and the Bible second. Its impact cuts across genres. 1963 Academy Award winning, in fact, three Academy Award winning films. 2018, the Broadway production of To Kill a Mockingbird, which has now had the highest grossing sales of any play in American history. When the uh, second Harper Lee novel, or perhaps more accurately, the first draft of Kill a Mockingbird was uh, released in 2014, Go Set a Watchman, it broke Barnes and Noble's records for the greatest amount of uh, book sales on the opening day. In the first week, I think it sold something like 1. million copies and Amazon pre-order sales for Go Set a Watchman toppled all its previous records. When you have a work of art that attracts this much devotion, really, because this is a book that people not only like and not only love, this is the kind of book, as one of the surveys uh, indicated, that people are inclined to say, this book changed my life. And when you have a work that is having that kind of impact over that amount of time through diversity of settings, you're dealing with something that people are identifying with at at least two levels. Certainly, there are as many personal reasons why people are attracted to the book as there are people. You might, for instance, identify with the book because you were a tomboy. Or perhaps you grew up in a, a small town and maybe even a, a, a southern small town that on the outside looked sleepy, or as Jim described it, like a caterpillar in a cocoon that was warm, but not yet entirely born. This is Jim's metaphor. Perhaps you grew up in a town like that and that attracts you to the book. Or perhaps it's Atticus's sort of steadfast commitment to a certain uh, morality or ethical uh, code to which one doesn't, um, one doesn't 
relinquish, even in the face of objection, even in the face perhaps of derision. Perhaps those are reasons why different people with different kind of life paths would identify with the book. But certainly when you're talking about over 55 million people, you can't only explain its appeal through those idiosyncratic connections. And it is the source, the, the universal, you might say, uh, the universal magic of this book. Why is it that this many people over this amount of time are drawn to this book with this degree of zeal? That is the question I'd kind of want to ask myself and explore with you. What might be that universal dimension of this book? So that's, that's our uh, angle of engagement. And I, I think a good place to start would be with uh, uh, Jim's experiences in the sixth grade. Jim, as you know, is the brother of Scout. Scout is the principal protagonist. When the book opens, she's six years old uh, in Makeham, Alabama. Jim says to Scout, because Scout is expressing some real dissatisfaction with even the whole idea of school, which is not proven to be uh, particularly generative for her. He says to Scout not to worry because you don't really learn anything important in school until you get to the sixth grade. Um, I'm not sure that that was the case for, for me. Uh, I had some important things happen earlier that, but I can't remember anything particularly in the sixth grade. Uh, but in any case, that's what Jim's uh, vision was for Scout and her pedagogical trajectory. And the reason it turns out that sixth grade was uh, a threshold year in Jim's intellectual life is because in the sixth grade in Miss Blunt's class, Jim learned about the pyramids of Egypt and in particular, the caste system of Egypt. And this historical introduction to a social structure in a place far away in time and geography served Jim as a kind of, let's say, filter or lens through which he had a new perspective on Makeham and in particular Makeham's social structure. Social structure, we use this structure as a metaphor, thinking of architecture and things that are physical, but a social structure, of course, is not visible in the same way a structure of an edifice might be. And so to get a sense of it, uh, requires a different kind of vision than what the eyes alone will empirically reveal. So with the, the con construct of the Egyptian caste system, which placed the Pharaoh at the top, the slaves at the bottom, and the courtiers, let's say one strata below the Pharaoh and on down the line, with this construct, Jim was able to see that, you know what? It looks like Makeham, our town, also has a caste system. And it becomes a source of intellectual uh, inquiry on Jim's part to try to flesh out what the different social classes are, hierarchically arranged in Makeham that would be in some way parallel to those hierarchical arrangements of Egypt. And he engages Scout in this conversation and they propose different kinds of theories of why, what particular person is here or there on this social pyramid. At the end of the day, uh, Jim proposes this. He says, I figured it out, Scout. In our caste system, or our pyramid, at the top are the white people like us, the Finches. One rung beneath us are the white people like the Cunninghams who live in the woods. Beneath the Cunninghams, Jim hypothesizes, are the Yules who live down by the dump. And beneath the Yules in our social structure of Makeham are the, are the Negroes. This is the terminology in, in the novel itself. And this is Jim's way of making a kind of analogous um, assessment of the way people in Makeham organize themselves in ways that are not visible to the naked eye, but that manifest themselves in all kinds of events. And the novel brings the camera in to close focus on how the pyramid operates in the minds of Macomians in two principal settings. The first setting is that of the jurors in the trial of Tom Robinson. Tom Robinson is accused by uh, Bob Yule of raping his daughter, and there is a trial, and 
the, the judge of the Makem appoints Atticus to defend Tom Robinson. And in this trial, the jurors are, they are presented with two narratives. They, of course, weren't at the scene of the incident. So they have no way of knowing through a firsthand conviction what in fact has happened and are relying on two narratives that they're proposed to them to decide what in fact transpired between Mayella Yule and Tom Robinson. In one narrative, uh, the narrative proposed by the prosecution, uh, it is in keeping with what Bob Yule has claimed that his daughter was accosted and subsequently raped by this black man. But Atticus presents an alternative narrative that the jurors are asked to, to consider. And in Atticus's presentation, it is in fact Mayella Yule who sexually accosts Tom Robinson. And there is some reason, some in fact irrefutable reasons, why it was physically impossible for Tom Robinson to have beaten and raped Mayella Yule. And that particular anatomical reason was because Tom Robinson's left arm, which was shorter than his right, was not, uh, it, 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 the arm was not functional. And it turned out that it is the right side of Mayella Yule's face that is bruised and shows that it has been struck multiple times. It also turns out that Mayella Yule's father, Bob Yule, is left-handed. So the arm that uh, Tom Robinson can't use and the side of the face that that arm would have struck turns out to be the side of the face that Bob Yule's lead hand was actually uh, functional. So there is some reasons that are irrefutable reasons, you would think, that Tom Robinson could not have done what he's accused to do. Nevertheless, the jurors are presented with those two, with that two different narratives. Now, I will, I'm trying to flesh out how this pyramid works, how this caste system manifests itself in the way people make sense, in this case, interpret two proposals of, a, of a, an actual event. The fact that the jurors, despite physically irrefutable evidence, the fact that the jurors come back and render a verdict of guilty to Tom Robinson illustrates how the pyramid functions in real time. Because what essentially this case turned on was this question. Could a white woman be sexually attracted to a black man? And according to the pyramid, if Mayella Yule occupies the third strata on this social hierarchy, and African American people are beneath her, then it is not imaginable. And the key word here is imaginable. It's not imaginable given the pyramid or caste system that the jurors of Makem have internalized. In other words, they're not really rendering a verdict on what happened in real time between these actual people. The verdict is actually saying that in Makem, this pyramid is not malleable. This pyramid and its structure is not up for negotiation. And whatever may or may not be happen in the quote unquote real world, what is most real to us is this social structure. And we are going to keep this social structure. Now, these are not things that people say consciously. And nevertheless, it is as Atticus to Jim after the, the children are despondent because they know that, that in, a gross injustice has been carried out. And they're, uh, they're not only despondent about the, the, the case itself, their entire sense of the world as a place that makes sense, where there are things called justice and right and wrong, all of those kinds of things that they took for granted in their state of innocence. Because of this event, that has been shattered. In many ways now they're walking around in a world that they had previously never imagined existed and they have seen its ugly face and are distraught understandably about it. And Atticus explains to Jim that in a situation as that of a black man uh, accused of raping a white woman, 
that those jurors simply were not rendering a verdict based on reason. As he says to Jim, something came between their mind and reason. And what I'm proposing came between their mind and reason is this particular caste system that then manifested itself in the verdict that they rendered. That is one context where you see the caste system in play and, and how it manifests itself. A second setting in which this caste is on uh, full display would be the missionary circle. This is the group of ladies. And you can see the binary structure here. It is the men who are in the setting of the jury box. It is the women who are in the setting of the missionary circle. And in this missionary circle, and we wanna keep an eye on that word circle. In the setting of the circle, the, the ladies and led by Miss Grace Merriweather, the most, uh, the most moral person, and at this point, Scout is being openly ironic. Uh, the most moral woman of Maycomb is um, expressing really her, her fatigue at the fact that the African-American people are being surly about the verdict. And she suggests to the other ladies that they need to keep in mind that they should forgive the African-American people, or as she calls them, the, the, the darkies. They should forgive the darkies uh, for their attitude at the moment because that's the Christian thing to do. So this, again, is exemplifying the way that people are assigned different strata and the way reality is interpreted through the lens of that social structure. One of the things that we learn about Ann Alexandra is that she is, in addition to being the amanuensis of the missionary circle, which is to say two things, she is the secretary and the memory. That's what amanuensis suggests, that Ann Alexandra is the memory of the missionary circle. And Alexandra is also has this peculiar gift of knowing everyone in Maycomb according to the tribe to which he or she belongs. And not only does she know what everyone's tribal affiliation is, she knows what the particular uh, distinguishing characteristic about that tribe, and it is always a disreputable characteristic that she refers to as a streak. So this particular tribe of people or family, they have a, a flighty streak. Or this group, in the case of, of, of Gertrude Farrow and the Pharaoh, they have a drinking streak, for instance. Well, Aunt Alexandra knows every group by their tribal name, and she knows what it is about that group that has determined its place on a social hierarchy. This conversation that takes place in the context of a missionary circle are just so many ways that through gossip, that pyramid is assigning through the imagination of the participants, everyone's rightful place in the social hierarchy and um, more fundamentally and perhaps perver perversely, because it is the missionary circle, this social strata that has been shown to be exploitive, demeaning, Indeed, in the case of Tom Robinson, deadly. This social structure is positioned as something sanctioned by God himself. In this way, then, the people who are themselves identifying with the pyramid are not responsible because God has a So the missionary circle, in other words, is using uh, religion to sanctify and to legitimate the particular structure that keeps everyone in Maycomb in his or her place, principally through gossip. To, to, to demonstrate just how upside down this is, Grace Merriweather, in addition to talking about the darkies and Maycomb being a surly, uh, tells the story about a great missionary, Methodist missionary, J. Everett Grimes. And she met J. Everett Grimes at a church revival, at, I guess a church camp, before he went back to Africa to save the Maruna people. This is apparently a, a tribe of people in Africa, Harper Lee, it's not based on an actual people in Africa. She made up the, the name Marunas. Uh, but Grace Merriweather explains that J. Everett Grimes is such a, he's such a good man that he has dedicated his life to saving the Maruna people. And these people she described are remarkably 
primitive. And as she gives the details of their lives, the ladies are listening aghast at, at a people that could be uh, so uncivilized. And the way the Marunas live, according to Grace Merriweather, they all, to eat and drink, they all chew the bark of a common tree. Uh, they then go and spit into a pot and they drink together out of this pot. She describes this as, as, as a ritual and a practice that is distinctive of the Maruna people as an example of just how uncivilized, unchristian they in fact are. The point I want to underscore though in this context is how this pyramid, not only has it been the lens through which the jurors have rendered their verdict about something they didn't see in person, it, that same pyramid now is being projected across the, the entire world, as these ladies in the missionary circle imagine it, exist according to this pyramid structure that they just happen to be close to the apex of. And not only is, do they have a, this privileged place in the social pyramid, it is a pyramid that God himself has a decree or created. This is an example of... And I bring all this up because our big um, inquiry here, or our kind of essay of sorts, is what could be the universal appeal of this novel? And my guess is that most people uh, understand that pyramid and how it works rather intuitively, because if you're like me, you've encountered this social pyramid through many instances and perhaps, perhaps maybe the majority of your social life. When I look back on junior high and high school and even elementary school, I can very well see a, a kind of social pyramid in which different people were said to be along to this group. They were the athletes, they were the geeks, they were the nerds, and then there were the people who smoked or did other kinds of things that were uh, scandalous, and they all carried these reputations throughout their life. Well, what were we doing? We were putting people in, in their place in a social hierarchy. In fact, this is a, a kind of uh, structure that is not only we could say endemic to people and not, not universal because there's no reason to conclude that people have always and at all times organized themselves in social pyramids. In fact, there's evidence of, of people not organizing themselves in that way. Nevertheless, it does seem to be pervasive and not only within the human species, but also among uh, animals and mammals and particularly primates. I took a class at the University of Texas on primate behaviors. We studied uh, Sykes and vervet monkeys and they organized themselves in a social pyramid. And I remember as I learned this and we did actual observation, it's sort of maybe like Jim hit me right between the eyes. Oh my goodness, uh, this monkey business is very much people business. So that's a way and reason I believe that this novel beneath perhaps the conscious surface we can identify with the idea that people identify themselves in kinds of caste. But this novel is not an ironic novel. It's not a satire. It's not a tragedy. It doesn't end, in other words, with the pyramid getting the last word. Uh, there's another social structure that manifests itself, but not as obviously in the novel. And I want to propose what the images are in the novel that give us a glimpse of what it would mean to live off of the pyramid. And I think there's two principal images. The first, perhaps you remember that on a, a day out of nowhere, snow comes to make them and the whole town school is let out because it never snows in make them. And on this uh, day out of school, uh, day out of school, uh, Jim decides that, that this Snow could be put to good use by making a snowman. However, the snow is so minimal that Jim is not able to gather enough to, to make a, a snowman. So he supplements his snow with the soil, the dirt there in, in his yard. And he begins to put these together this snowman, part snow and part dirt. And initially he's using as his model, one of his neighbors named Mr. Avery. But as he completes this snowman, it looks so much like Mr. Avery that the uh, kids decide, or perhaps Atticus is, admonishes them, that they would be mocking Mr. Avery. And so they decided that they would incorporate Miss Maudie, their next across the street neighbor, in this uh, snowman's uh, 
manifestation. And so they go across to Miss Monty's house and they, they gather her, I think her clippers and one of her hats. She's a big gardener and they incorporate this into the snowman. And, and anyway, when they finish this snowman from across the street, Miss Monty hollers to the kids, to Jim and Scout, you've created an absolute morphodite. Now, to my knowledge, morphodite is a neologism. In other words, uh, uh, Harper Lee, as far as I can tell, made up this word. It's a very interesting word. It sounds a little bit like hermaphrodite. It certainly, through the morph, uh, emphasizes the body and the morphing or the trans -morph transformation, the morphing of a body. This absolute morphodite, uh, if we were to imagine how it is constituted. Well, first of all, it is part white. It is part black because of the snow and because of the, the dirt. It is part male, part female, part natural, part artificial. In other words, the absolute morphodite is a combination of things that are seemingly opposite, that seemingly should be in discrete place, have been brought together in a common place and out of those ingredients, a human body has been created. I'm suggesting that this is an image that can be contrasted with a social pyramid. That in the social pyramid, everyone has his or her place and those things don't intermingle, they don't cross borders. But in the absolute morphodite, all things come together to be one thing and no one thing is superior to another thing. That's one image of what the pyramid could be contrasted with. Another image going back to those Marunas. Very, very interesting, the, these Marunas and their relationship to a tree and of a, a common source of sustenance. And here's why I think it's interesting. If you think a little bit about what these Marunas are doing, perhaps you remember the movie Avatar and the Navi people and their relationship to a tree and the way uh, uh, they were all in some sense finding the source of their life in this common tree. The Maruna people, you might say, are doing something in their rituals that if you think about it, looks, and here's the irony of the missionary circle, looks a whole lot like communion. I mean, if someone were to come from a, another planet to visit a, a church where communion was being offered and someone was to explain what was happening, uh, it would be something like, well, you see, uh, the, that bread there is, is the body of these people's God. And that wine, well, that's the blood of these people's God. And what they're doing is they're eating that body and then they're drinking that blood. That, I guess, would be, well, if you think about that, it's starting to sound not unlike what the Marunas are doing, of finding a, 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 a way both in actual practice and perhaps imaginatively and symbolically, to remember, as an RE hyphen member, remember through this common source of sustenance. Remember, I mentioned that there's our primary concerns of food, but then those primary concerns can modulate into, you could say, existential or spiritual concerns so that the food for the body can also be a food, a soul food, you might say. And what these Marunas are doing is they're organizing themselves not in a nuclear family as is the case in Makem. And this is what has the ladies of the missionary circle so convinced it's not civilized because only the nuclear family, according to this pyramidal structure, could be considered uh, God's sanction. These people are living. And what are they doing? They are becoming one body that is not characterized by tribal distinctions and a social hierarchy. In other words, the absolute morphodite, which Jim and Scout make, and the Maruna people are other structures that contrast or can be contrasted with the caste system. How, you might ask, does one move from living within a caste system to living otherwise, particularly if you're in the middle of a town like that? Uh, this, you might say, is the deep plot of the novel. The principal plot, of course, is bringing out this character named Boo Radley to coax Boo Radley from coming out of his house. A deeper plot might be, will Scout and Jim assimilate the pyramid 
the pyramid that has played itself out in the juror box and the missionary circle, will they internalize that? Will it become their mind structure, so to speak, their frame of reference? Or will they uh, be delivered from the social structure of Macon? Will they get outside of it and imagine a different way of being human? This, you might say, is the subtextual plot of the novel. And I want to propose, with a little bit of time that we have left, a very here's a wonderful scene. As you know, when Scout and Jim return from the high school from their celebration of the Halloween party and, and pageant, which combined on the same night, Scout is wearing a ham. Scout is dressed as a ham for Halloween. And she and Jim, when they're coming home, are attacked by Bob Buell, who's going to get his revenge on Atticus for humiliating him in the trial, because Atticus has exposed the fact that, in fact, he has sexually molested his daughter. Everyone knew that, whether or not they would have, whether would agree to it in public or not. And in retribution to Atticus, Bob Buell is going to kill his children. I have multiple times, if you have your protagonist in what can be considered the climax the action climax of the novel, dressed as a ham. If ever there was a moment in which something was blinking in red neon lights, this is a symbol. Well, this would be the moment when your main character whose life or death situation is dressed as a ham. You, you're gonna have to come to terms with what in the world is that ham symbolized because if it's clearly, if, even if we were gonna say that Halloween, it had to be, why be dressed as a ham? I, I don't recall any of my friends or myself ever dressing. I do. I can see Casper, the friendly ghost, Spider-Man, Frankenstein, witches, uh, angels, fairies. I don't remember any hams. Well, I, that perplexed me for a long time. Until I learned through some kind of uh, reading, all of a sudden, I learned that the land of Egypt was known by the Hebrew people as the land of ham. And when that came to my awareness, then all of the imagery related to Egypt in the novel, including the fact that the sixth grade, Jim entered his Egyptian period. Scout says he began to walk stiffly like a stork, imitating and make fun of, making fun of him. And then all of a sudden, Aunt Alexandra, why Aunt Alexandra? Well, that's associated with, with Egypt. Uh, and then uh, it started to occur to me that there was something going on that looked very much like the Exodus story taking place in this novel. Uh, Northrop Frye, the great literary mind of the 20th century, uh, proposed that all works of literature evolved out of myth. Certainly in this novel, if you scratch the surface, you can see that the myth of Exodus is playing itself out in a novel context. To come out of the ham, in other words, is to come out of the mentality, to come out of the mindset of a caste. This is the moment in which Scout is delivered from the mentality, symbolically the moment in which she comes out of this caste system that has and, and really body snatched the people of make. She's coming out of that social structure into a new kind of consciousness. And it's not long after she's saved by Boo Radley that Boo Radley escorts Scout back to the Radley house. He, in fact, leads her. She insists that he is the lead as he walks her down the street. Their arms are locked together, hooked together, almost as if it was a, a marriage ceremony. When she enters the Radley gate, she says it was the second time in her life she had entered the Radley yard. The first time is when she came rolling in a tire it was a game that she and Jim and Dill were playing. They put her in a tire and they rolled her, in this instance, rolled her too hard. And she rolled right into the Radley yard and hit up against the porch. Well, this was the second time that she had entered the Radley yard. She goes to the front door and Boo Radley walks into the house and she remarks, and I never saw him again. Now at this point, uh, Scout is nine years old, maybe 10 years old, and she, it's not plausible that the person that just saved her life, because it doesn't say that Boo Radley died. It just says that she was to never see him again. And so I knew that there was something to be thought through there. Uh, after he, Boo Radley steps into the house, she walks over to the window. The window at which Boo Radley has been standing 
throughout the novel watching the children and watching Makeham. That's perhaps the basis of Go Set a Watchman because Boo Radley is the watchman of Makeham. Well, she stands at the window and she has Boo Radley's perspective now on the town. Here's the moment. Remember that Atticus told her, if you learn one simple trick, Scout, you'll get along a lot better with people. That simple trick was to see the world from their eyes, and he described it metaphorically as to climb into their skin, and perhaps for them to climb into your skin. Well, this, I'm going to suggest, is precisely what has happened here. When Scout comes out of the ham, Boo Radley enters into Scout. She never sees, excuse me, Scout never sees Boo again, because from here on out, she will see with Boo. She won't see Boo. Boo will, in fact, be her eyes. She's had an eye transplant, so to speak. And as she's standing at that window, she describes Makeham, and very interesting about the description, and we can wrap up with this. She sees Makeham in four seasons simultaneously. She sees Makeham, in other words, not in ordinary time. She's no longer in clock time. She's in some other kind of dimension of time in which all things are present. And she sees how every facet of Makeham is drawn together. And what brings them together? You, if you will read this, this moment when a scout is describing what she sees from the Radley window, and I'm hypothesizing with Boo's eyes, she begins by seeing... Uh, moments from the past, they're now made present. And as she begins to describe these moments, she initially starts out that she is seeing Atticus as her father and as Jim's father. And this is his children and the his is referring the pronoun to Atticus in the first several uh, vignettes that she describes. But by the last vignette, you read this scene carefully, the pronoun his, as is his and her father, the his of the his of his children modulates or migrates from Atticus to Boo Radley. So by the final vista, the father and his children are Scout and Jim. The implication would be that Boo Radley, who after all is named after a ghost, who's described as so translucently white, she could almost see through him, whose hair is described as that of a bird, who's initially, uh, when Jim challenges, when Dill challenges Jim the first time to go touch the house, he says, I'll trade you one gray ghost for two Tom Swifts. He's saying, if you'll go touch the Radley house, I'll give you this book, The Gray Ghost. There's another ghost. And then two Tom Swifts, there's another bird. If you see, in other words, if you read the novel, uh, Boo Radley is through images identified with both a ghost and a bird. In effect, then, this spirit, this, you could say, speaking of Casper, this Holy Ghost, as Scout has experienced it, is something that is potentially within everyone in Makeup. In other words, uh, just as the Maroonas are having a common source of sustenance from that tree, it's quite possible, and this brings us now to Boo's tree, and remember the first gift from the tree? What was it? It was chewing gum with the Mig Wrigley Double Mint wrapper taken off, chewing gum. Remember now the Maroonas chewing that bark? Well, here is Scout, the first gift that she gets from the tree is something to chew. She, in effect, that tree that Scout receives and Jim receives these gifts from Boo is analogous, you could say, or identified with this tree of the Maroona. And it is a source of life. It is the gifts that come down are all gifts to images to lead Scout and Jim out of the caste system of Makeham. And I'm suggesting that the way you make an absolute morphodite amongst real people is that they share a common spirit, not that they become uniform, that they have rather unity with maximum diversity. Remember, the morphodite is difference, differences coming together, uh, not everyone being the same. So in other words, if we're sharing something, you could say spiritually or imaginatively, that brings us together, we get the best of both worlds of being uniquely who we are, singularly who we are, including in all the ways that are not common. And yet at the same time, we don't have to fragment out into balkanized little identity spaces because we do share a kind of common body, metaphorically speaking.
In any case, I want to conclude by saying the reason I believe we're drawn to this novel and the reason it has such universal or universal-like appeal is because we can feel the reality of both that caste system or social pyramid and the reality of being a part of other bodies so that my skin encapsulated ego is not really the limits of who I am because Part of who I am is in you, and part of who you are is in me. And when I come to identify with you, or as Attica says, see the world through your eyes, then we have walked away, walked out of, in fact, the pyramid or the caste system that we are typically identified with. I wish that we had more time uh, to, to discuss this because we barely scratched the surface, but we do have a little time for questions that may have been proffered to one of our facilitators. And I'll take what time's left to, to share with you what thoughts, and perhaps it's not a question, it's a comment, but whatever. This is a space now that we can begin to unpack. And what, what I've shared, you just, it's Walt Whitman said, if I said something that uh, insults your soul, just dismiss it. That's the great thing about literature. There's no right or wrong answer, but we can come together as if we're chewing from a common tree, this time a book, and we can see what we can uh, internalize from each other's perspective. So I'm, I'm open for questions, whatever folks want to do now. Michael, one of the things that came up in some of our discussions was how To Kill a Mockingbird is different from Ghosts at a Watchman. So having read both of those, what do you think the difference is? I would say the difference is so distinctive that it almost constitutes one of the great living examples of the power of the imagination when it transcends the ego. And this is what I mean by that. Uh, undoubtedly goes set a watchman is a early draft of what became to kill a mockingbird if you read that novel as i have you i experienced it as as a extended sort of uh commentary on racism in the south but it read more like a, a, a monologue of a person almost like a their diary interest entry of going home except told in the third person and have encountered a bunch of people that now since the person has moved away to new york and come back home now she sees through all of the kind of racist attitudes but my point is it it doesn't it doesn't move my imagination. It seems to make a succession of points. It's like, a, it's, it's got like morals to it. Like it was a kind of extended sermon uh, to kill a mockingbird. And I should mention that I found it, you know, it really sort of boring to read. And I can't imagine why I'd want to read it again, except for, for analytical or, or academic purposes, but I wouldn't read it for fun. If you take that and then compare it to what is the most popular novel ever written in English. I mean, if, if a relatively pedestrian, almost borderline failure, if, if not, a I mean, it's enough a failure that the publisher sent it back and said, I don't think this is going to work. Can you take another? I mean, that's how big of a failure. From that to the most popular novel ever written in English, something strange happened. So I want to say there's a qualitative difference. I think it is a, an early draft, but something happened between those two novels that explains the... the the power of To Kill a Mockingbird as compared with the earlier draft. In other words, you might say, what's the difference here? What happened that turned this sort of pedestrian draft into this incredible work of art? What's the difference? I think that's a, a remarkably interesting question. And, and do you think, I know we talked about this a little bit, you kind of talked about how one is telling what the author wanted to say and the other is showing what Absolutely. the author wanted. Absolutely. That's a good way to put it. You know, the imagination, the very word imagination has in it image. And the imagination communicates in images. The intellect communicates in concepts like propositions, you know, like, uh, I don't know, a little learning is a dangerous thing. That's, that's a concept or a proposition. Well, that's not how uh, works of fiction, as fiction, communicate. That They're closer to a, a moving picture and um, so, yes, the one difference between the two is that To Kill a Mockingbird reveals something to the imagination that is unlike in its presentation, and I would say in, in, in its consequence, than the succession of sort of moral uh, admon admonishments and of norms that are kind of made in, a, in an almost essay fashion. So yeah, there's some, something is starting to, 
something is starting to come alive and it's coming alive through images and not through commentary. And it's interesting because I think, you know, you talked about ego and it, it seems like that's come up in a lot of the things that I've read lately. And, and the idea that the, the author's ego almost has to get out of the way for them to be able to write these somewhat inspired works of literature, right? Well, the very idea of a muse speaks to that. And how many artists across different forms of art will, will say, I was more like a vehicle. Or I was, it was like a midwife. I mean, something happened through me. We're going to be talking about a Toni Morrison's Song of Solomon. And the pre pre preface to that, she indicates just straight out, you know, straight prose from her. I used to think all this stuff about the muse was a little bit whatever. But now, having written this novel, I'm a believer in it. And then gives an example why. So I would definitely say that there is something about fictional verbal structures that invites aspects of consciousness that we're typically not in direct communion with invites those aspects of our consciousness to get a word in edgewise. And with those aspects of consciousness, what you're having is a very different set of eyes that are perceiving, you could say they're perceiving the same world from a very different set of eyes. And if you think of the climax of To Kill a Mockingbird and the what it is that Scout sees when she stands in front of Boo's window, I mean, after all, Boo has been the watchman. If you want to say, where does that draft name come from? Well, Boo is the watchman. And then that plays off two things. One, he's watching the kids, but also it relates to time. Time is a watch. Any case, so Scout is standing in front of the window of Boo Radley, and she sees Makem, as she says, the first time from this angle. And from that angle, she experiences all four seasons simultaneously. In other words, Scout's no longer in time as we know it. And what I would pr pr proffer is that what Scout sees from that perspective, you can even say with Boo's eyes uh, identified with her own or even replacing her own, what she sees now is another, it's, it's the same make them from a different, you could say height or depth of consciousness. The, the make them hasn't changed if you mean empirically, is there, is it, is all of a sudden all, you know, like what was it, Stephen Wright? has a joke about someone broke in my house and replaced everything with an exact replica. I mean, some got a funny line, like it's not like everything in Makem has been replaced with an exact, it, it is Makem. What is different now is the dimension of consciousness that is perceiving it. And I would say, I mentioned, you know, the, the eight books, I mean, excuse me, eight, eight uh, months, four books and you, well, it's, it's that transforming the consciousness so that you see what was previously the real world through a whole new set of eyes. That's what fiction is up to. Yes, it's playful. Yes, it's an art, but there is a profound sort of potential with respect to the world that we share that's at play in fiction. In other words, there's you, Mozart, you could say, was just playing around with sounds. Yes, these are people playing around with words. But what playing around with words at this level can do, I'm suggesting, is to affect consciousness that gets us, however transiently, outside of our ego's perspective. Well, so that kind of leads, you talked a little bit about the end of the book, and I know after the lecture, I went back to the text to reread that end where Boo is standing, or Scout is standing in Boo's, on Boo's porch, looking out the window and seeing seeing make him for the first time kind of through his eyes and then I did what I often do is I went right back to the beginning of the book and started it over again just out of curiosity to see how far we'd come and what I noticed there in rereading it was just in the first couple pages is that you we get introduced to Dill in in just those first few pages and the first thing he says to Jem and Scout is he introduces himself and he says I can read and that really struck me because we, the book talks about, and then it, you know, he, he ends up arguing with Jem about Jem's like, well, so what? Scout can read and she's younger than you are. And so there's, I, I kind of wanted to, to ask you, what, what do you think is the role that reading plays? How, how does it play? Um, because it obviously is, is central to the novel. It comes up time and time again. Yeah, that's a great line because Bill says that completely out of the blue. <laughs> It was a complete non sequitur, and I can read. And then he adds, if you got anything that needs reading, you can give it to me. <laughs> uh, well, well, let's think about this for just a second. You know, if we read this novel and Scout has this transformation in consciousness, that's pretty cool. But that's just something that happens to this fictional person named Scout. 
However, if we read the novel and something like that happens to us, well, now, now we're not just talking about a make-believe place called Makem Once Upon a Time in a work of fiction. We're, we're talking about here and now. So it, it, it goes back to early comments. Ultimately, the, the impact of this novel depends upon the reader's reception of it. And uh, for that reason, reading, not just in this novel, we'll, we have four more, three more novels to go, and I'm confident we're going to discern that reading and even writing in the case, say for instance, of Jane Eyre who's trying to tell her story, this is a, a common persistent subtext. In other words, great works are, are awful, often self-reflective about the process of writing. Think about uh, the things they carried with Tim O'Brien, how much it explicitly talks about he's writing this novel to, to create a body for Timmy, to create a place for Timmy to live. So really, um, all, all that to say that the, the novel's consequence multiplied times a hundred thousand if it involves the reader and what's at stake. And that's why, and also and, and critical here is how one reads is going to determine how this novel ends. Miss Motti explains to Scout that Boo Radley's father is a foot washing Baptist. And she explicitly distinguishes them from the kind of Baptist she is because foot washing Baptists take the Bible literally. So there's a, a real direct connection between Boo, the son, being sentenced to stay inside his house. That is to say, isolated and cut off from others. There is, there is a, there is a implicit uh, comparison, not even comparison, identification being made between the way Boo Radley's father reads the Bible and what he's done to his son. And there is a way that we could think about reading that would be the opposite of what Mr. Radley did to Boo. And that would be a kind of reading that invites Boo to come out. And there you have it. That's the plot of the novel. Can Scout, Jim, and Dill get Boo Radley to come out of his house? So based on what we're saying, is there a way of reading that the, 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 the spirit or character that was previously trapped in this abode, or we could say analogously trapped inside this novel, is there a way of reading it that enables that spirit to come out into my imagination? And this, the novel is suggesting that that is not reading literally, that's reading metaphorically, or you could even say spiritually. Well, and it's interesting because even if you go back to when when Scout finally gets to school and her teacher says, well, you've been taught how to read wrong, like don't <laughs> learn anymore at home, you know, it, it's getting back, it's pointing out again, you know, is there a right way and a wrong way? And if Scout's being told the wrong way at home, you know, what kind of, yeah, it's trying to keep her in that structure, right? In that make them structure of Ooh. a hierarchy. That's a profoundly insightful that the whole second chapter is about this. In fact, one of the things that Scout says is Jim says I was born reading. Okay, we can think of that as a throwaway line. It just means I read a lot. But if you read the words, it's precisely what they're saying and not through the words to what we expect or what our sort of projection is, then what she's saying literally is she was born reading, that there was a part of her that, that came to birth in the act of reading. And, and, and even it gets even really, really specific about the two different ways of reading because Jim explains to Scout that she's learning the Dewey Decimal System. And then in a kind of farcical way, he it, it goes on to explain that in this new way of reading, you, don't, you just don't read about a cow, you go out and look at a cow. And then that's how you, well, look, about, look at what that is saying. That's about as literal, that's about, that's, that is an absolute spoof on what it means to read literally. So a, a cow out there in the real world in some sense is not what works of fiction are all about. Works of fiction are about taking that, that cow that you see out in the real world and putting it in an imaginative structure that reveals its true identity, which is very different than just a cow as an empirical cow. In other words, she learned to read from letters. In fact, it's very specific. She learned uh, how to read and write one, by reading and copying pages out of the Bible. So Calpurnia would have her spell out the alphabet and then copy a chapter from the Bible. 
So it's not only that the book is saying there's different ways of reading, it's even explicitly connecting this potential of being born reading with something that's coming through scripture. But notice how that is not how Mr. Radley reads. Yeah. You know, if you come from the South, you do know, and this is the same true with Jane Eyre, who grew up in a context where the Bible was just as authoritative. If you grow up in the Bible Belt, you know that all reality goes back to a Bible verse. I mean, if you're arguing about someone, even an intellectual argument, you can just say, yeah, but uh, Ezekiel tells us in chapter three, and then you, then you just lay down the law. But So you will start to understand in the South that all reality goes back to the Bible. Well, if you think about that, then how you read the Bible is going to be absolutely crucial to the rest of your life. And this novel brings that out in the starkest possible terms because the, the, the kind of reading that Boo Radley's father does and the same kind of mentality is the way those jurors read the narrative. The jurors are presented with two narratives of what Tom Robinson did or didn't do. And there's the same mentality that put Boo Radley in his house, put Tom Robinson in prison. It's a deadly way of reading. And this, even the Apostle Paul says that, that the letter killeth. If you read the scriptures with the letter, which is say literally, it killeth. But if you read the letters in the spirit of the letters, which you can say metaphorically, which is not mean uh, fic illusorily, it just means with a different dimension of consciousness. If you read the scripture in that way, it quickeneth or giveth life. This program brought to you in part by Selco. Funding for this program is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota.